think we're I think we're gonna get started. So thank you everybody for coming. Um, for those who don't know, I am Matt Girding. I'm a city councilor here in Summers Earth. I usually sit right there, but I have the privilege of getting to sit there tonight, which I'm kind of happy about. <laughs> um, I'm also running for mayor for folks who haven't yet heard. So just a kind of shameless plug. Um, but I'm really, really thankful that we have uh, New Hampshire School of Funding Fairness Project with us here tonight to talk about uh, property taxes and school funding um, because as I'm sure folks who follow City Council are aware, we talk a lot about um, how the state underfunds our city uh, pretty often uh, sitting here at um, our seats as counselors. And I know the school board talks about it a lot too. I mean, just this budget year alone, um, the city lost 900, about $900,000 from the state in adequacy aid alone, just in that, N not you know even talking about some of the other things that we receive from the state. Um, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money for a community that um, has a pretty high rate of free and reduced lunch. Uh, we were just chatting about this earlier. We are above 50% uh, last I checked. Um, we also have a large number of students who are uh, special needs. Uh, which also places extra costs on our schools to be able to afford to have those students. Uh, we do a phenomenal job in our schools um, with uh, students with special needs. But again, it's uh, costly and the state doesn't uh, assist in the way that it needs to so that uh, our community and our families uh, aren't burdened by that. And sadly, that's the case as of right now. We see uh, tax rates and you know the differential that we see in our budget, the, that $900,000 I just talked about, that uh, gets downshifted onto us as a city, as a community, to have to cover those costs, those, those lost revenues. And it becomes expensive and it becomes really hard because it's you and I who pay that out of our property tax bills. And if you're a renter, it's your landlord who probably pushes that cost down to you in the form of your rent. And um, those are costs that, you know, as someone who's both a taxpayer and a city councilor, that is, are really difficult to pay sometimes. And for a large number of our families, I see it time and time again. And I hear it time and time again that, oh, why are property taxes going up this year? And then oftentimes the biggest reason is exactly that. It is the state not setting uh, its adequacy amounts for our community at a level that is sustainable. Um, and if it were to adequately address this problem and face it head on, I would bet you we would see our tax rate drop uh, significantly because a large portion of that, those costs, a large, large portion of that money that we as a community have to pay out of our pockets would then instead come from the state and would be their responsibility, which is constitutionally <laughs> how it is supposed to be. It is in the New Hampshire Constitution that the state is responsible for that. And I won't steal the limelight uh, from go ahead. my colleague here who will tell you plenty about that I am sure tonight. Um, but I do think it's important to stress because it's something that as your city councilor and as all of the city councilors, I, can't, I, can't, I think I'm willing to speak for all of them, we are aware of that um, and we really want you to know that this is a problem we are thinking about, we are addressing head on, and we hope that by having this event tonight, um, you can learn more about it too. Uh, so thank you all so, so much for coming. If you're watching at home, wherever you are, these cameras, I assume, uh, thank you for watching. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it off to John Tobin. Thank you again so My much pleasure. for being here. My and, pleasure. Uh, thank you yeah, for, for having me, Matt. Thanks. Okay. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, and I think uh, Matt just gave you a great introduction. Um, the problems that Summersworth faces that we'll be talking about are faced to a greater or lesser extent by more than three quarters of the communities in the state. Um, and we will get into those um, in more detail. I wanna, before I start, I wanna just call your attention to the materials that Carly from our project has over there. There's one, this one, maybe the most important one, how, can, how you can get engaged, how we can do something about this. Then there's a paper um, that Carly did that has some of the details about the taxes and costs here in Summersworth, and I will t touch on some of those. And then the third paper is about some of the educational consequences of this unfair system in um, Summersworth. So, um, 
I've been at this a long time, and how I got into this whole question was um, as a young legal aid lawyer in Berlin, um, and I became a parent, bought my first house, um, and Berlin at that time, this was in the mid-70s, was a thriving blue-collar community that had strong schools, and um, you know, kids did well there, and student, the teachers were um, well thought of. Um, and I, as a young parent, I was all fired up to make sure that the schools stayed good for my kids. So I went to the, down to the city hall in Berlin, sort of like this place, all fired up to talk about, you need to support this, the school budget. And then I saw that there were a lot of my elderly neighbors in the auditorium. And they said, we care about the schools. We want the schools to succeed, but we can't afford the property taxes. And that really a light went on for me. I could see how the current system pits elderly people against parents and educators um, in so many communities. So that's why I'm doing this. I was one of the lawyers in the Claremont case, working with Andy Belinsky and a number of other people. We thought we won. Um, we did win. The legislature made some half-hearted attempts to improve the system and did put some more money into it. But as, as we'll talk about, in the last 20 years, they've really backpedaled. So um, I and some other people started this project, the School Funding Fairness Project. Carly is a staff person. I was uh, one of the founders and originally board chair, and now I've stepped back a little bit. Um, I'm still on the board. Um, but um, our, we are a nonpartisan organization seeking, it's really a civics project, seeking to educate people around the state about how this system works, the nuts and bolts of it, and then um, what they need to do as an exercise in democracy to try to change it. Um, there are also, there's a new round of lawsuits, and I'm involved in one of those, and I'll talk about those too. So the School Funding Fairness Project, we're trying to make the system more fair to students and taxpayers. And this is a picture of kids from Berlin. We did, um, Andy Valinsky and I did a presentation up there a few years ago, and uh, some of the kids in the graphic arts class created this banner and this slogan, and there was some city event in Berlin and they marched through there and, and we have this picture here to remind us about this is all about kids. This is about their futures and what they need to succeed. Um, and then um, um, this is the picture of the other side of it, taxpayers and particularly elderly taxpayers. Um, this system really strains people struggling to pay their property taxes. When I was a legal aid lawyer, I had lots and lots of cases where people could no longer pay their taxes and they were in danger of using, losing their homes. And a lot, a lot of those were in places like Summersworth where the taxes were already high and the pressure was immense. The city leaders thought, God, if we give tax breaks, everybody will be entitled to one and we can't do it. And it was because the property tax system put everybody in a box. So this is about students and about taxpayers. Um, and as, as um, Matt said real well, neither students or taxpayers are treated fairly. The problem is getting worse, as you will see, and the current system is unconstitutional. So this is, this is kind of the outline of the things we're going to talk about. First, about the Constitution, then sort of explain how the property tax system works, then talk about the state aid is here and the need is here, um, and then talk about some of the consequences of the system to our communities. And then finally talk about some possible answers. Um, so the Constitution, the, the constitutional principles are pretty s simple. The first, and these, were stat these basically come from our Constitution, which was written in 1784. The Claremont cases brought them back to life. And we've had a cycle in New Hampshire history where the state has been responsible about providing for education and then lost that responsibility about 100 years ago, and that's why we're still fighting out. Anyway, the first principle is the state of New Hampshire has a duty to pay for a constitutionally adequate education. And that's an unfortunate phrase, constitutionally adequate, because it's more than adequate, and we'll talk about that in a minute. 
What does that phrase mean, constitutionally adequate? The other key principle is that whatever taxes the state picks to meet that duty, the rate has to be the same across the state. Um, you, you all know that the um, business profits tax or the interest and dividends tax or the rooms and meals tax, the rates, those are state taxes and the rates are the same across the state. That's the principle we're talking about. Um, so what is an adequate education? It's not reading, writing, and arithmetic from the 1950s when I went to elementary school. The Supreme Court was very wise about this. They said it's not just that mere competence. It's giving kids the tools they need to succeed locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally in the 21st century. Um, and the court recognized that, and here's the quote. Um, it's about an exposure to science and technology and languages and politics and health, the things that kids need to succeed. Um, and so that's constitutionally adequate is an unfortunate phrase, but that's what the court meant. And then when, what the court also said is whatever the state decides is constitutionally adequate, it has to pay for. It can't delegate that responsibility or slough off that responsibility to counties or towns. It has to pay for it. It can delegate the work, and obviously we have local school districts with local school boards who play major roles, but in terms of paying for the responsibility, that's on the state, and they can't slip out of it, although they're trying. And what about property taxes? It's, not, it's never up to the court to pick the way, the revenue source for paying for schools. But the court did say, if the legislature picks property taxes as the way to meet this burden, the rate has to be the same across the state. So those are the constitutional principles. Um, and because, nothing's, because things have really backslid in the last 20 years, there are two new cases. One is called the Conval case, which is named after the Kentucky Valley Regional School District and a number of other school districts joined. That one was filed in 2019. It went up to the, the trial judge ruled in favor of the school districts. The state appealed. The Supreme Court, after a year and a half, sent it back for a trial. That trial was held in April and May. So now it's up to the Superior Court judge to make a decision, and he's working on that. And he had three weeks of witnesses and things to, to digest and uh, sort out. So he, I'm sure he's working hard on it, and we hope we expect a decision within a month. Um, that's the sort of hint he's get, giving us. The second case is a more taxpayer-focused case, the RAND case. That's the one I have a role in, and that's on behalf of taxpayers, business taxpayers and residential taxpayers. Um, in places where the taxes are high because the tax base is low. And basically, the gist of that case is because the state is not paying for nearly, uh, nothing close to the actual cost of an adequate education, local taxpayers like you all in Summersworth have to make up the difference. And because of varying property wealth, the rates that are charged across the state to make up that difference vary greatly in violation of that principle we were just talking about. So um, we had a trial scheduled in that case for September, and the judge put it off so that he could write the Conval decision, which will inform and guide what happens in the Rand case. So, um, and there are a couple of other crazy things involved in the Rand case. There's, you probably don't notice it, but on your property tax bill, there are two school taxes. There's one, the local tax, and one called the state-wide education tax, and that one has a very low rate, but there are a couple of interesting wrinkles to that um, that we are challenging. One is that in certain wealthy communities, because they're so wealthy, they raise some extra money, and that state money, it's a state tax, it should go back into the pot to help meet the state burden, but they keep it and use it for their own. So they, those wealthy communities get essentially a, a break. They get, in essence, a lower rate. The other thing that we didn't even know about for a few years ago is there are a small number of places, many of which don't have many students or population, but a lot of valuable property, who don't pay the SWEPT at all. And essentially the state allows them by doing what's called a negative tax rate. So we're challenging those two things in addition to the whole system 
We're awaiting a decision from the judge on that too. So this, it's unfortunate that I had to do this in my 40s and 50s and again in my 70s, um, but I'm hoping that this time it'll get finally straightened out. So that's the constitutional background. Now I want to talk about property taxes. And this is, this pie chart shows where the money comes from to pay for schools. In New Hampshire, we spend um, more than three and a half billion dollars a year on public schools. And the blue is the portion of that that comes from property taxes. And you can see 60% from the local taxes, 10% from the swept, which is another property tax. So more than 70% of New Hampshire school funding comes from property taxes. The state, the, what the state kicks in is in the green. And to give, you know, to be fair, we can put the swept in green and raise that percentage from about 20% to about 30%. But basically, local property taxpayers bear a huge burden, and the state only pays a small part of it. And one of the questions we used to get in this presentation a lot is, what about the lottery? Lots of advertising about the lottery. The lottery is doing this and doing that. But you can see, in fact, in terms of yearly expenditures, it only covers about 4%. Um, so this, one of our themes is things has got, have gotten worse. This is a chart about where all the new money has been raised um, in the last 10 years. As costs went up, who paid for those costs? You can see that more than $600 million new dollars came out of property taxpayers. Um, state adequacy aid, barely, hard, barely anything. Um, somewhat, some federal aid. But essentially, in the last, since 2012, property taxpayers have been hit harder and harder and harder, and the state has really contributed not much more. Uh, so this, I, I want to give you a little bit of information to put the property tax system in New Hampshire in perspective. When you listen to news about the state and state taxes, we hear a lot about the business profits tax and the um, business enterprise tax and recently about the interest and dividends tax. We'll look at this chart. Property taxes, um, the county tax, the municipal tax, and the, and the two school taxes are over $4 billion. Those two business taxes are only, you know, you can see what they are. Um, they're only a little bit over one billion. So, um, in point of fact, businesses pay more property taxes than they pay BET or BPT. Everybody pays an enormous amount of property taxes. And so, New Hampshire is a low tax state. Generally, our tax burden is low, but you can see it's very um, out of proportion. It's really all on the property taxpayer. And here's another way of looking at that, um, looking at income levels and who pays property taxes. And you can see that people with the lower your income is, the higher percentage of your income you have to pay on property taxes. Because property tax is a regressive tax. It's not based on ability to pay. And so low and middle income people get hit especially hard on property taxes. And where, how do we fit in the rest of the country? Well, our reliance on property taxes is the highest in the USA. Um, we, 64% of the revenue in the state comes from property taxes. That is the highest in the USA. And then the other side of this is how much does the state kick in compared to other states in terms of school funding? Um, the percentage of money that comes from the state to pay for schools in New Hampshire is the lowest of the state. So we have the highest tax burden and the lowest percentage-wise help from the state. And one, other th one thing that I really want to point out, and I really want to say to all of you in this room, people in New Hampshire care about their schools and they sacrifice for their schools. You all sacrifice for your schools. I think it's frankly heroic. You care enough about the schools to pay high property taxes to keep them going. Um, and the system keeps making that worse 
and people keep stepping up, but we need to, we need to address it. So now I want to talk about property taxes in different communities and do some comparisons. And the way to do that is this concept called equalized value per, people, per pupil. And it sounds like college economics, but it's really pretty simple. It's how much property wealth is there in your community per pupil? And the virtue of this is that it adjusts for different size school populations. And the DRA, the Department of Revenue Administration, adjusts for the fact that assessments take place at different times in different towns. So it's, it's calculated in a way to compare apples to apples in terms of tax rates um, across communities. So how does that work? And this is a sort of a simple example. Imagine two communities. One has a total of property value in their community of a million dollars, and one has $400,000. And that disparity is actually small as compared to their places. Um, there are examples I can give you where one community's property value is 18 times another, um, which is 1,800%. Which is 1, and anyway, think about something that both of those school districts need that um, cost $10,000. Maybe it's a box of computers. Maybe it's, a, it's, um, maybe it's the electric bill for their school. Something that the cost is going to be the same from district to district to district. In district number one that has $100,000, or a million dollars, I'm sorry, in property values, to raise that $100,000 for that box of books or computers or whatever it is, they need a tax rate of $10 per thousand. In that other community, that same tax rate will only raise $4,000. So in order for that other community that's less wealthy to get to that same cost figure, they have to have a rate of 25 per thousand. And that's, that, this, in essence, is the inequity in our system because the total property values in communities vary so greatly. People in the less property wealthy communities have to run faster and sacrifice more, and even so, uh, for the same thing, and even so, it's really hard to keep up. If kids and property were all distributed equally, no problem, but they're not. Um, and we have municipalities that were set up hundreds of years ago, economies that have really changed, so we have vi really varying populations and economies in our communities. So here's, here's sort of an overview of how this plays out, um, looking at um, certain communities. And what we try to do in this chart is pair communities that have about the same enrollment, um, but really different property wealth. And the, the top line is the New Hampshire average. So we have 165,000 public school students in New Hampshire now. The a average in the district, that means a little more than uh, one and a half million dollars of property per kid. So the average tax rate is, you can see, a little less than ten dollars. And as property values have been growing recently, and so you can see how much that raised. Then go down just to Portsmouth and Milford. They have almost exactly the same number of kids, but look at the difference in property value per kid. In Portsmouth, it's three point eight million. In Milford, it's a little more than a million. So Milford is much less than half of the state average. Um, and Portsmouth is well over twice the state average. So Portsmouth can have a much lower tax rate because they got all that property to tax and still raise a ton of money for their kids. Whereas Milford, they have to tax their property a lot higher. And they, even doing that, they can't keep up in terms of how much money they raise. And this is math. This is just, if you set up a system that's based on property value in a district, this is how it works. So going down the column a little bit, um, look at New London and Bristol. The small districts, um, the property disparity isn't as great, um, but there still is some. Um, if you look at Bow and Claremont, they are almost the same in terms of st student population. Um, and Bo is under the average. Bo, people think of that as sort of a bedroom community for Concord, but in fact, it's, it's below average in property wealth. 
But Claremont is so much lower. Claremont is only 632,000 per kid. That's way less than half of the average. Compare that to Portsmouth, it's less than one-sixth of the property wealth per kid. Um, so you can see, if you do these comparisons, you can see that in the property wealthy towns, they can have a lower tax rate, raise a lot more money, spend a lot more money on all kinds of things to make their schools better. In the less property wealthy towns, taxpayers have to pay a lot more and they can't keep up. So here's a chart that um, sets out this for a number of the communities here. Summersworth, Do Dover, Rollinsford, Exeter, et cetera, Durham and Portsmouth, Rochester. Um, and you can see how in a lot of the communities around here, the equalized value is below or at about the state average. Um, Durham, it's a little higher, and as we've said, in Portsmouth, it's a lot higher. So Durham and Portsmouth, can, they can raise a lot more money with less hardship. It's just, it's not, it has nothing to do with effort or efficiency or anything like that. It has to do with how much, how valuable is the property, and therefore, how high do you have to tax it to raise money? So here's another way of looking at this. Um, the red line at the bottom of this is the state average. So you can see a lot of the communities here are, again, somewhat below the average in terms of property wealth. And then there are, then there's Hampton and Portsmouth and Rye that are way above it. Um, and so that means they just have the capacity to raise a lot of money um, without imposing hardship on people. So this, I like to think of this chart, and it's not, a not clear in some ways, but in some ways, in terms of getting to a solution in the politics of it, this one may be the most important one. A and the reason is because three quarters of the students in New Hampshire and three quarters of the property taxpayers are in towns with below average property wealth. So three quarters of the students and taxpayers are treated unfairly by this system. Um, and the interesting thing is those, where those 75% are is all over the state. Some of them are deep red districts. Some of them are deep blue districts. Some of them are um, cities and towns. Some of them are small. All the, the cities in New Hampshire, except Lebanon and Portsmouth, are at the short end of this, they have below average. Um, and that, you know, the extreme examples of that are Claremont um, and Berlin, but even Concord and Nashua and Manchester have below average and, and they struggle. Um, and where are the, you know, what's the, what are the characteristics of the communities that have a lot of property wealth? Well, it turns out that it isn't necessarily commercial development. It's natural assets. They have a lake or a river or an ocean or a mountain um, that drives up property values. Um, and a century ago, where was the property wealth? It was in the mill towns. And the tourist industry hadn't taken off. And in a similar sort of education funding crisis, it was the mill towns that needed to send money to the rural districts. Well, now property wealth has sort of shifted to the, the property that's most valuable for tourism here, and those towns benefit. So there's a coalition inherent in this of R districts and D districts that get hurt by this system. If they could band together, they, they would have the capacity to make change. So this is a fun thing. Okay, you can read the descriptions of these two properties, and you can see the picture. Um, and I'll just give you a sec to do that. And it's sort of a trick question, but in some ways, I don't think it's a trick question. Um, Rochester and Newington, um, very different properties, but the one in Rochester, the taxes are higher. And again, it's a function of, there's a lot of property wealth in Newington. So a property that's very valuable there um, they have a very low tax rate. And so, and in Rochester, which doesn't have the property wealth, even a 
property that's not, that's of modest value gets hit with an equivalent tax bill. Um, So um, the next thing I want to talk about is the state aid, um, what the state does and doesn't do to address this. And this legislature, just in this past session in this budget, raised the amounts for the categories of adequacy aid a little bit. Um, and um, the numbers don't, they, the numbers go up a few hundred dollars as a result of those changes. But the, the, as you'll see in a minute, there's a, we have a chart that shows how much the state gives you local communities and how much you have to raise. Um, it's, the state adequacy aid is what they call base adequacy for every kid. And then there's stipends if you have kids that are English language learners, if they receive special ed, um, and if they are poor. And the way that the state measures that is are they eligible for free or reduced lunch. Um, so these numbers have gone up a little bit, but not in any significant way. So here's how current adequacy grants play out as compared to costs. Um, in Summersworth, um, in 2022, you got about $5,100 in state aid, and your costs, as you can see, were almost 20000 a year. And the, the similarities are all across there. You can see that the actual costs dwarf what the state contributes. And that, you know, what the state contributes is in the neighborhood maybe of 20%, some places a little less, a little more, um, really dwarfing. And, and um, the difference between the blue and the green is on you um, through your property tax payments. So um, some colleagues of mine did an experiment about, and the, the, the idea was, well, what would this adequacy aid really pay for? And what would we have to cut if all we had was adequacy aid, which the state said is enough to give kids an adequate education? So we've done this in Pittsfield and other places. And the most recent example was in Allenstown. So according to the state's calculations, they thought Allenstown could provide an adequate education for less than $5,000 per year. Um, so the total amount that they were going to send was 2.4 million. The actual budget in Allentown was about 12 million. So what uh, our colleague did with the business manager in that district, he said, "What are we going to cut out of our actual budget so that we're only spending what the state gives us? How do we get down to that number so we're, you know, we're supposedly meeting a responsibility, but we're not spending?" extra beyond adequacy. So they started cutting things. They got out the spreadsheets with all the costs, um, cut out all busing, all support for English language learners, all special ed contracts, all supplies, copiers, insurance, plumbing and heating repairs, no art, no music, no PE equipment, no Chromebooks, no sports, no field trips. Um, three of the four custodians gone. And this is just the first page. Um, school board stipends, maybe we don't care about that. But um, no summer programs, no art teacher, no music teacher, no phys ed teacher. One of the two nurses gone. Eliminate both guidance counselors. Um, this, the technology people, still not there. Um, eliminate some of the special ed people, um, the reading specialist, the library person. Um, no grounds maintenance, um, you know, no plowing, um, drop out of the SAU. And when they did that, they still weren't there. So the next thing they had to do was cut all the payments for their high school kids. Allenstown sends their kids to uh, Pembroke Academy. And they weren't even close to getting down to the state's figure. They said, okay, adequacy in Allenstown will stop at the eighth grade. Um, and then they still had to cut teachers and eliminate all kinds of things. So they had these higher student teacher ratios for grades five through eight, it would be 38 students per teacher and no schools after eighth grade. And that's what the state would pay for. 
cut all those services, there would be these teachers left. No busing, no all those other things, uh, and no education beyond the eighth grade. That's, what, that's how much the state aid would actually pay for. And there's no one in the world that could say that that's adequate education. So there are other, obviously, the consequences of the system, you all know really well the consequences of the system for taxpayers and for school budgets and for school services. Um, but there are other consequences, too, that, that go beyond that. Um, you know, one of the consequences is that certain districts can um, spend more for salaries. Um, if your taxes are already high, you have a hard time competing for teachers um, because of the tax burden. And so what does that mean? I had a, a principal tell me in a, in a uh, less property wealthy district that he felt like he was uh, the manager of the Pawtucket Red Sox. And they got new teachers and they were fired up and enthusiastic I and mean, they trained them and then they went down the road and got a, a salary of ten or $15,000 more a year. And not that those salaries were going to make them millionaires, but the difference in terms of being able to live between a $40,000 salary and a $55,000 salary are significant. So you can see, again, if you look at Portsmouth, starting salaries are a lot higher. Um, and if you have a master's, um, you get a lot more money. And that has consequences. In lots of districts, the staff turnover is great because students or teachers get a little experience and they go somewhere else where they still can be teachers, but they're paid more. Um, and that has education consequences and morale consequences. One interesting example of how this works, how crazy it is, is this is, um, there's a uh, school district not real far from here called Timberlane, and it has these four towns. Um, and the way I think about this is imagine a kid, um, you know, sophomore biology class, and there's a girl from Danville, and her best friend is from Atkinson, and they're in the same class, and they get the same, they're basically getting the same education. It's identical education. But the parents, of the girl from Danville are paying a much higher property tax rate because the property values in Danville are less than half of what they are in Atkinson. So um, even where people have made rational decisions to regionalize schools, there's still a lot of tension because the property wealth varies a lot, sometimes within those districts. And sometimes that pulls districts apart. Sometimes communities feel like, well, maybe we should just go on our own because we can do better um, and we don't have to support this poor district. So the system currently makes it, you know, every school district for itself. Um, and that has consequences too. So w one of the other consequences is, and I, one way to think about this is to s sort of step back from politics and say, all of us, conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican, would want our state government to foster economic development fairly across the state. They wouldn't want our state to play favorites in terms of where economic development happens. Um, unfortunately, this school funding system, which as you've seen is the biggest tax operation going on in the state, does play favorites. It discourages economic development in some places and encourages it other places. And the, as the mayor of Berlin said at a session like this, you know, why would a rational business person build a new factory in Berlin where the school system is struggling because it doesn't have enough money and the taxes are high instead of taking that business somewhere else? So state policy, state tax policy does play favorites. And we know that. We know that some communities in our state are struggling and some are prospering. And there are a lot of factors at work in those things. But one of the factors at work is the inequities that the system creates and perpetuates and drives. Um, and you know, one of the things, there's a lot of talk in New Hampshire about um, workforce housing and affordable housing. Um, but for decades here, lots of municipal officials took the rational position that if we create new housing and bring in new families, we're going to have um, higher school populations and higher property taxes and 
we don't want that. Our people can't afford that. So a lot of that kind of housing was discouraged in a lot of places because the current system discouraged it. And when you think about that, how crazy is a public policy that discourages families and the housing for families? That's a recipe for a shrinking population. Um, but this system implicitly does that, not because people are consciously anti-family, but because this tax system has incentives and disincentives. And in a lot of the communities in the state, it's, it's really a hardship. Um, so this is a quick slide. There's some of this stuff in the stuff that Carly prepared the papers about um, student metrics. And um, I, am, I am sure that the people in this school district work really hard to, to do the best they can to give their kids what, what they can. But this, people in Summersworth don't have the assets in their school system that the people in Bow or Portsmouth or Hanover or Moultonboro have. And that inevitably plays out. Um, so now I want to talk about, well, what can we do about it? And the most important thing, um, again, in, in this flyer talks about a little bit, is to be in touch with your elected leaders to let them know that you want them to change it. And coming up in the next few weeks is um, some deadlines for senators and House members to file bills for the 2024 legislative session. So it would be, it's really timely to s contact state reps, senators, and say, what bills are you filing or supporting to address this in the next legislative session? Um, what can we do? Um, and there, um, you know, there are lots of different ideas, but it's fair to ask them what, what do they have in mind to do about this property tax burden and its uh, disparities and disproportionality and um, how are they going to work on that? And one of the interesting things is if we're going to keep relying on property taxes, we need to have a, a, something so that people who truly can't afford them get tax relief without that coming out of their neighbor. Um, in other states, there are state programs to provide tax relief for low-income people. Some of them are called what's a circuit breaker. If your property taxes are above your income level, you only pay this and the state comes in and makes up the difference for your town. So the town gets its money, but the fact that you can't afford it doesn't come out of your neighbor's property taxes. So there are lots of ideas like that. The legislature has been considering some of them. Um, but they really need to hear from you. And if there's a lesson from Claremont case aftermath is that the legislature didn't hear enough from us about property taxes. And I think the property taxes in New Hampshire are something that we thought was, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just a fact of life like winter. Well, in fact, there is a lot that can be done about it. And there are other places that don't do it this way. So now I just want to talk about a little bit about how else, um, how the money could be raised in other ways. And again, starting back with the pie chart, right now 70% of the money comes out of property taxes. If we decide that's great, we love our property taxes in New Hampshire, we could at least make the rate the same for everybody. And we could make sure that there's good, strong tax relief. Um, so, in a lot of ways, what the, when you put a number to it, the state has downshifted $2.3 billion onto local property taxpayers like you. Uh, they're not paying. That's the difference between what they're um, paying and what the actual costs are. Um, so then what we really need to do um, is put that responsibility back on the state. That's where the Constitution says it's belong. The state has the resources. The state can spread that burden around. So that $2.3 billion is, has been downshifted. We need to upshift it. And that doesn't mean that uh, somebody from Massachusetts or Canada is going to pay the taxes. But it means that people in New Hampshire will pay taxes in a fair way. So 
in 2020, the legislature created a commission to try to look at this whole pro problem. Um, and they hired a set of national experts who've studied school funding in a lot of states. And they, they came to the conclusion that everybody else has. This system that we have now is unfair for taxpayers and for students. The places like Summersworth that serve a higher percentage of disadvantaged kids spend less because they can't raise as much, um, even though those kids need, probably need more services. Um, and the, the districts that have fewer of those kids have more property wealth, so they, they get an a unfair deal both ways. Um, and, you know, they said that the negative relationship between uh, student outcomes and student poverty is really clear. Um, and so that's why we need to have state aid that focuses, that gives districts like Summersworth the resources they need to deal with the kids they have that need more services, need more help. So this is, I had alluded to the fact that the legislature just changed these amounts a little bit. And you can see um, they're very small changes. Uh, if you compare the current law and then the final, you know, and we're talking the average expenditure is 20000 a year, and the, di the net difference in what the state was paying and will pay um, is less than 1000 um, so it's very small change. And the other thing that they did, unfortunately, is they cut some aid that has helped places like Summersworth for a long time. Um, there's something called stabilization grants, which has a long history, but the origin of it was to give communities like Summersworth with less property wealth some extra money to make up the difference. Not all of the difference, um, but some of it. But in this latest budget, they decided to start cutting that back. And that, that's going to hurt here. It's going to hurt here. I, and uh, they also decided um, in that budget to repeal the interest and dividends tax. Um, and that's $135 million in state revenue. An awful lot of that money came from people with a lot of wealth. Um, so this is a list of places that this, this budget has what are called hold harmless grants um, to prevent some of those cuts from taking place right away. But they're going to get, those hold harmless grants are going to get cut by 20% a year. So they're trying to soften the blow of the fact that they're taking aid away from poor communities. Um, so how do, we, how do we raise revenue? Um, and he, we don't have a favorite among all of these. We think that's the legislature's job, and we think it's your, ultimately, your voice should be heard. But we, what we do think is really important is that you all know what the choices are and what the pros and cons are and um, how other states do this. So this is a list. We could go back to the business tax rates at 2015. Um, we could decide not to eliminate the interest and dividends tax. New Hampshire used to have an estate tax. Um, we could reinstate that. Um, we could do some new taxes on wealth. We could have a capital gains tax. We could have what's called a financial transactions tax, a very, you know, 0.001% tax on stock trading that people wouldn't even notice but would raise a lot of money. Um, we could have a true statewide property tax of about $10 per thousand, which would be lower than most places and would eliminate most local property taxes. And in places like Portsmouth, that means that their property taxes would go up. Places like Summersworth, they would go down. Um, we could mix and match. We could have a a property tax, true statewide property tax of half that rate and fill in from some of these other sources. So there's a lot of different ways to bring this money in to doing something about the crazy property tax system we have. We have a lot of different choices. But 
but we need to let our legislators know that we want them to think about this. We want them to um, get the research done to figure out how much, you know, if the capital gains tax was 4%, what would it raise? Um, if the business taxes went back up to their prior levels, what would it raise? Um, so that then you have some pieces of information and you can make it into a puzzle and say, we need 2.3 billion, how do we get there? Which pieces? So here's how other states do it. And these are the, this is a discussion that sometimes get you, gets people struck dead by lightning in New Hampshire. But um, we need to at least give you the information about what's going on. Other places, lots of places have sales tax, including our neighboring states, or income taxes. And you can see in this chart how much those places raise through those taxes. We don't have to do it that way. There are lots of the other menu that I showed you. Um, we could do it without doing either of these things. Um, but but we sh people should know what the choices are in a meaningful way, what they would raise, you know, what the exemptions would be. We ought to have a discussion in the way that people have discussions about lots of things, financial things, before decisions get made. So this is where we're at right now. Neither taxpayers nor students are treated equitably or fairly. And, and that's absolutely true of Summersworth and Rochester and Dover and many other places in New Hampshire. The state's downshifting its responsibility to property taxpayers like all of you. The system's gotten worse. Um, the current system is unconstitutional. And it's on the mechanisms of our democracy, our state legislature, to fix it. Um, and they need to hear from us. They really need to hear from us. And that's what we're trying to make happen. So this is way, sort of a little thing that we say to summarize this up. Your tax burden and your educational opportunities as a kid shouldn't depend on your zip code. Um, it, you shouldn't get a vastly different educational opportunity if you live in Bo or Hanover than if you live somewhere else. It's just not fair. That's not what we believe in as a society. Um, and taxpayers, the same thing. So um, what to do? Tell, talk to your friends and neighbors about it. Get on the case of the candidates. I admire people who run for office. But when they run for office, they sign up for um, being contacted again and again and again by their constituents. That's democracy. So don't feel bad about contacting them. That's what they're there for. They expect it. And I've heard legislators tell me if they hear from 10 people about an issue, they really take it seriously. Um, we have this legislature in New Hampshire that's pretty accessible because we have so many reps. And so they are accessible. They don't have staff, so they can't do their own research. But if you contact them, if 10 of you contact them, they will take notice. That's, that's the way it works. We, we do have democracy here. Um, share things on social media. Don't ask me how to do that. Ask her. Um, but that's a, a lot of that is going on. Um, and pay attention to this. We're going um, to send you a follow-up to this session where you will be able to get the slides if you want. Um, and we just encourage you to keep this going. It's really. Um, it's really on us as citizens. If we want to fix this, the mechanism is there. But we just have to be persistent and insistent. And the system, our political system in New Hampshire can respond if, if, it, if it hears from enough people. It can happen. So that's, the, that's who we are, Fair Funding um, School Funding Fairness Project. Um, I'd be glad to answer questions. Okay, so I'll start in the back and I'll go that way. And it, when you say the question and then I'm going to repeat it so that the people at home will hear it in okay. case they don't hear you. All right, well, I'm going to ask about the very obvious question. So we're talking a lot about raising more revenue to support the school system. <coughs> uh, the public school system is uh, very important. We need that. And I saw your list where, um, like, cutting out programs, so have we looked at other efficiencies 
Very good question, and I think efficiency is really important, and I think that's something that school boards, and I think most of them are, thinking about and looking at a lot, and using technology. I mean, we all had an experience during the pandemic about the pros and cons of using technology, and people initially thought technology was going to really be great, and we could do schooling from now on that way, and we found out that, in fact, in lots of ways, it's really there are a few kids that benefit but a lot of kids really suffer so there are a lot of things to look at technology um, different kinds of specialized training there are you know we have a lot of kids and we have a lot of adults in our society now with mental health problems and schools are starting to bring in mental health specialists instead of having the teacher teaching 25 kids and also trying to be a mental health counselor make a such a counsel available so the teacher can identify that kid and that kid can get more help and the rest of their classroom go on. One of the other big things about efficiency is the structure of our school districts. And especially in, uh, maybe not so much in this area, but in a lot of the rural areas, we have school districts that are small and the enrollments have gone down. And one might think that merging them or combining them would lead to some efficiencies in spending and lots of things. The system we're talking about really discourages that because if you're a dist in District A and you have a little bit more property wealth than your neighboring district, you don't want to partner with them because you're going to get stuck supporting them because the state's not going to help you. Um, and so if we improved our funding so that it was more equitable, that would open the gates for, I think, a lot of reorganization of school districts in rural areas, which has happened in other states. And I'm not saying that that's a panacea. There, one of the things that's going on in the Contuca Valley School District, that's the lead district in the case, that's a sprawling district. I think it's eight or nine towns. It's very, they could be more efficient if they had fewer elementary schools. They have eight or nine small elementary schools in those communities. Those communities are reluctant for understandable reasons to give up that elementary school. They could probably save some money. On the other hand, their kids would be on the buses for a longer time. So the challenges are great. But I think, I think there is room for innovation in structure, in instruction, um, in, in who provides services. Um, I think there's, there's lots of room. And I think that's part of what a good school board does is ask those questions and teach yourself about what other people are doing. So, yes, next. You mentioned fairness a couple of times. I thought it would be fair to allow either parents whose children don't attend the public or individuals who don't have children attend the public schools to opt out that's that's a profound question and let me answer it from my own experience when I started school in 1954 not 1854 1954 I did I didn't have any money and my parents did not have money to send me to private school who paid for my public education the other people in the town I lived in of multi-generations um, because it was a community enterprise and it's an intergenerational responsibility. And now my kids are long gone and I have grandchildren, but they don't live in New Hampshire. But I feel very strongly that I want to give back. It's an intergenerational responsibility we have as communities. Whether or not we happen to have kids in the public schools. Public schools are central to our society. If you travel around 
especially small communities in this state, they are central to people's lives. I was involved in the dispute in Croydon a year ago where people came in and tried to cut that budget in half, which would have eliminated all the teachers and they would have had some people who really weren't qualified come in and sit with people on computers. And across the ideological spectrum in Croydon, the Trump voters and the Biden voters, they all said, this little school in Croydon is really, it's a community enterprise and our kids go there and my, I went there. And so I think, it, I, I think we have a, a sort of political, moral, social, intergenerational obligation to support schools, even if we don't happen to have a kid in them. Quick sure. Um, no, it was a pretty arbitrary percentage, um, and it was done on a snowy school morn school uh, meeting where very few people were there, um, and it was you know the intent was to gut the public schools and the people who brought it are they're not fans of public schools, which one has a right to be in this you know one can advocate for the ab abolition of public schools. It's a free country, but. That's not what Croydon people wanted, and I think that's not what most people want. And I think most people cherish their schools. They want to make sure that they work, but I think most people recognize the intergenerational public responsibility we have to, to support them. You had a question in the blue shirt. How much is enough? How much is enough for what? Well, I think what we're saying is whatever the decision is about how much, we all should pay at the same rate to, to pay for that. Um, it's not fair that people in Summersworth pay a much higher rate than people in Portsmouth, and they get less because they have less. So what we're really talking about is um, fair taxation and fair distribution of the resources. Um, how this goes back to the other question of are there efficiencies to be gained? Are there things that can be learned to save money? Absolutely. But what we're not, and those questions should be answered and, and people should be thinking about that in an ongoing way. But we have a more basic fairness problem. We, people pay very different rates and get very different resources here. And we need to fix that. That's the urgent problem. Fred Bramante, in the back. Yes. Um, so, uh, a couple of things in questions earlier. Um, the, the, when I looked at the possible solution, um, one of the concerns that, that I have is the difference between, so to speak, in the, uh, uh, lately, and I have not been, so I'm sure you are more familiar with it than I am. But, but my understanding was. That, first of all, that the Constitution only talks about taxation. It talks about a, um, whatever you use for a, a tax, it has to be a, a proportional rate across the state. Right. Which we don't have right now. Right. Because the, the richest community, the property richest communities in the state have found a way to get out of actually contributing. Yeah. Totally with you that that's yeah. un un unconstitutional. unconstitutional. But I am looking at the difference between the word provide an adequate education, pay for an adequate education. My understanding the Constitution calls for providing, doesn't call for paying with a flat rate, not with a flat rate, with a uh, with a flat amount. Yes. In the, way, in the way, the way every single tax in the state works is it's a flat rate, it's a flat cigarette tax, it's a flat room to meal tax, um, whatever the tax is, all of the money gets sent to Concord, then Concord decides where 
it needs to spend the money where it, it, it needs to help. So to me, this can be done at a lower rate if we are not talking about spending whatever that uh, amount per pupil that, that somebody is going to decide to the community uh, like uh, Waterville Valley or Newington or, or uh, uh, you know, the, the communities that, that are, are the ones that have been blessed by geography uh, that have the multiple millions of dollars worth of property per, per pupil. So to me, there is a way to do this without breaking the bank if we look at it from, okay, yes, flat tax from how we raise the money, but not necessarily saying about why should, you know, Newington get the same dollar amount per pupil as, as Burlington when Newington doesn't need the money. There are two, two parts to that. Um, just for everybody realizing, I had the uh, Mike guy come up and said that, uh, John, you're doing a great job summarizing, so thank you. But okay. because some of the questions um, are not being fully heard, if you could come up to this microphone That's a good idea. to ask them in the future, it will just yeah. make things easier so yeah. John doesn't have to summarize. And yeah, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. Well, I will try to summarize Fred's point. He's saying that there's a distinction between the uniform rate that is required by our Constitution for any tax and how the money is allocated. And um, the Supreme Court actually said that in Claremont too. They said, we're not saying that the exact same amount of money in a cookie cutter way needs to go to each district. Um, and in fact, the, and the School Funding Commission said, you can probably pay for adequacy in Windham at $14,000, but in Manchester with Kids who don't speak English, lots of special needs kids, poor kids, it's gonna, they need more services. It's gonna, maybe it'll cost 21 or 22,000. Um, and so the, the, the aid needs to be allocated according to the needs of each district. And you know, in a rural district, they're gonna spend more money on busing kids from 10 or 15 miles away than they spend in Manchester. Um, so each district is gonna have different needs. But the point is, the core is a state responsibility. And we don't, you know, we don't decide that we're going to send less money to Newington for the post office or for roads or for any other state service because they happen to be wealthy. If it's a state obligation, we provide it um, and, and we pay for it with state funds. But it's not going to be the same level of an obligation in a wealthy district that it's going to be in a poor district. So other questions? I know there were um, in the front here. And then I'll come back to you in the back. Okay, yeah. Can I have to leave it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. yeah, I'm Rick Peralt, Mona's happy husband. You know, I think what we're talking about here is really fundamentally, and ever since I've heard about the Claremont decision, it's been a nightmare. And frankly, because uh, you know, you're not going to adequately give equality to every student for every purpose. I don't believe in that. I believe that what we're talking about today is okay, we need to raise a or have the state pay. Well, the state pay are the people sitting here. Yeah. It, you know, so what we're asking is you want to reshift and reshuffle to get 22, uh, let me see if I understand, 2.3 billion out of the state of New Hampshire. Well, yes. that's what, that is not going to come out of the sky or drop down or do anything. I understand that. We don't have sales tax. We don't have that. And you look at the New Hampshire state burden uh, per national. And quite frankly, I believe it's the Claremont problem. Because, you know, I grew up in Summersworth and went to school in Summersworth, and I paid a lot of taxes here, okay? And quite frankly, I live in Rochester, and I have a home on Lake Winnipesaukee, so I know how to pay a lot of tax. And we're not going to do less tax. And you're going to tell somebody here today it's less tax. It's not less tax. We've got a $2.3 billion shift that you want somehow magic in New Hampshire to somehow be some equity for everybody. Quite frankly, the school today, you know, we have less students. We just had uh, the commissioner of e uh, education. So, you know, really what we have is a fundamental problem with this is the Claremont decision. 
and maybe Claremont too, and you may have been involved with that, and I appreciate that, trying to fix something. But I don't think you're asking, and I don't, and I don't know the answer to this, but frankly, I don't believe in, you know, a $2.3 million tax shift is going to be a good thing. We have donor towns, and you know what? If your town can afford to educate the kids, let's, you know, have it in local control. Having state control this, I believe, is an error, and I believe Claremont caused the error. We can talk about it. I'm not sure it's a question. It's just a statement. Okay. A uh, couple things, yeah. um, and thank you for your question and your observations. First of all, the $2.3 billion, that's being paid now. That's not a, a, an additional burden. That's being paid right now in property taxes across the state at hugely disproportionate rates. So what we're talking about is not raising an extra $2.3 billion. It's how do we raise that $2.3 billion. So the way that this should work is whatever menu of alternatives we pick, that's going to result in lower local school taxes. And if it doesn't, people should raise hell. But um, in terms of local control, local control is great if you have resources. <coughs> local control in Allenstown and Claremont and many other places boils down to what do we cut next because we can't afford what we need. So local control becomes what do we cut next? And um, whereas in other places, it's what AP course can we add? What trip to wherever can we add? So local control makes a lot of sense. And what school boards and communities need around the state is the same level of resources. So then they can make their local decisions. Do we want our kids to learn Chinese or Japanese? Do we want our kids to have an extra chemistry class or this kind of AP class. We want to give local control life and meaning by giving every locality the, a level playing field of resources so that they can make local decisions. Simple as that. We don't have local control now. We have local hardship in many, many places. And, and you know, again, it's re local control is, OK, what do we cut next because we can't raising more money without really hurting our taxpayers, and the state isn't giving us more. So it's what do we cut next? I'm, I'm going to let other people, you've, you've already asked questions. I'm going to let some other people go. You, Me? please, <laughs> you go up there. Uh, I want to start out saying, um, I, I'm pretty loud, so I don't know if I need the mic, but <laughs> I just want to say thank you so much for being sure. here. This presentation sure. was phenomenal. And um, I love solving problems. That's just what I do as a financial strategist. Good for you. Um, I just want to say my name is Katara Maxi, and I actually um, am running for mayor as well. And oh. one of the things I plan on doing is making Summersworth the first financially independent city. Um, and because of the tax strategies that uh, I am familiar with, this what, you, what you've seen here today is very frightening. And um, I'm just letting you know it could all be avoided. We don't have to cut anything. We don't have to raise hell in our taxes anywhere. Um, it really is just financial literacy is number one. When it comes to solving all of our problems, we as individuals need to take responsibility and re-educate ourselves on uh, financial literacy. What is out there that has been out there for the last 40 years? What have wealthy people been doing? That is what we need to really reconcentrate our minds on. Because we can go out and get the money, but what do you do with that money? How do you invest it? What is the financial vehicle out there? So uh, right now, what you've seen was probably very frightening for our future, but I'm going to tell you that right now, this will not happen. We will not push more taxes on people. We're going to transfer that money over. And so we become our own bank. We become our own financial uh, self-insurance system. And so that is what I plan on implementing. So I would really like to speak with you a little bit further because sure. again, we can solve this and if we can solve it tomorrow, let's do it. Because I'm serious that it can happen overnight as long as we can just focus in, get the right people, um, get the right people who deal with the finances, get the right company, the Department of um, you know, Revenue. Those are the people that I need to speak with because again, if you can go down to a local level, but again, those officers, the, the, uh, the teachers, the people that we actually take our tax revenue from or pay our taxes to, you know, we're going to have to think about if, uh, if we're going to have to think about whether we want to provide uh, school funding or for safety and police officers. So we're up against a big battle right now, just not for our school funding. So I would like to help you solve this tomorrow. If Great. We can. So. Great. I'd be happy to talk <laughs> further with you. I mean, I think, let me just say something about the, 
conflict in, in places like this between municipal services and schools. Yeah. And it's, also, it's a function of this same system. And it's, it, gets, it has played out in different ways in places like Franklin and Manchester. Um, lots of places have decided, lots of, you know, through their local elections have decided we want decent municipal services and we want decent schools and so we're going to have high property taxes, which is not a cost-free decision because it really hurts taxpayers. Other places like Franklin and Manchester have decided we're really going to keep our taxes lower, not low, but lower, but we're really going to cut something. And in Franklin and Manchester, they cut schools. And so both of those school districts are really struggling with the basics. And test scores and everything else are really low in those places. And it's, it's sort of a rational Sophie's choice the, the leaders made. Our taxes, are, our people can't pay the taxes. So we're either going to have taxes that are really a burden or we're going to cut services. Berlin has decided to support its schools and its municipal services have suffered. But as long as, as it's a community that has less property wealth, you can try to slice it different ways. But if you have less wealth, um, then one part of what we all expect from government, or maybe both parts, are going to get hurt. So, um, yes, back there. Hello, um, I'm Michaela Denver. I sit on the Dover School Board, so this has been really wonderful. And um, great, good. The um, organization came to Dover about a year and a half ago yeah. to do the same thing. Good. So I had the opportunity to go hear Governor Sununu speak on I think it was Tuesday morning in Rochester at the State of the State um, address, and I had asked him this question, and he gave a lot of political maneuvering and didn't really answer it. Um, so I am curious to hear your answer which is um, we, those of us who have been paying attention to the lawsuits and the testimony, mm -hmm. um, heard C Education Commissioner Frank Edelblue say on record that he does not know how to define a constitutionally adequate education um, and, and therefore doesn't know how to define the cost of a constitutionally adequate education. Is this something that we're going to see? Is this something that we can or should? Well, we should. I'm not asking. I'm saying we should expect that from the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Is this something we're actually going to see any time in the future related to or outside of these lawsuits? Well, ideally, there shouldn't have to be a lawsuit. And when the question came up about whether state aid was enough, Ideally, one would look to the Department of Education to try to update the figures and try to get, you know, some economists and financial people and education experts to come in and figure out those figures. Uh, under this commissioner, he has stayed away from all of that. He has basically said, um, that's up to the legislature and I'm not getting involved. He didn't come and talk to the commission. He was invited to many times to, to talk to the commission about all of these issues, and he didn't come. Uh, you know, I think that just says where his priorities are at. I don't think his priorities are public schools. Um, and, um, you know, again, it's a free country. You can have different priorities and speak about them, and he may be running for governor and talking about them. But, you know, in a time of struggle in a lot of school districts, um, He's not playing an active role, and he's not playing a leadership role. Um, and that's unfortunate. That's just really unfortunate. We, you know, and I think one of the interesting things is the expectations about him in that arena are really low at this point. I mean, we don't really expect him to show up. And we didn't really expect that he would say he had any interest in having anybody at the department take a crack at figuring out what the cost should be in 2023. So, um, you know, during different crises in public schools in the, you know, in the last couple of years, you know, Franklin's had some real issues and so has Manchester and he doesn't see his role as leader in those situations. He has other fish to fry. We know what they are. Again, he got, you know, he got appointed by the governor and he got confirmed and he got reappointed and so he's there in favor of his policies, but he's not playing a leadership role in the public funding 
crisis. He just isn't. And um, we, we did a presentation just like this to the uh, State Board of Education um, a couple of years ago. He didn't ask a single question. Um, so it is almost 8.30. I'm happy to stay here till midnight, but some of you may want to leave. Um, so I don't know if there are any other questions that people have. Thank you very much for coming. I wouldn't mind asking another couple of questions. Cool. Come on up. You can ask me. I'm Ken Hilton, a, a Summersworth resident. When you say, what is the fairness to taxpayers uh, for their return on investment when funding increase, en enrollment's dropping, funding is increasing each year, Enrollment's dropping, and the results are declining. So if, I mean, we pay, I pay property taxes here in Summersworth, and my daughter goes to a private Christian school, which the, fun, with, which the cost, it average here in Summersworth's 20,000, 20, across the state's approximately 20,000. Her private Christian school is only about eight thousand, okay? So, but I, I, it cost me. I'm a plumber by trade, but it cost me twenty-eight thousand dollars a year for my child, mm -hmm. and she doesn't get any of the education out of Summersworth, and Summersworth still gets the money. So, I just, if, if we're talking fairness, like you're, you know, and I think. I think fair is a bad term because fairs come around once a year and they're really not that fun. So, uh, and I think that if you do the education freedom accounts and you can send your kid to whatever school you would like to go to, it's going to create competition in the schools, private, public, every school. But it should be across the board that your fund, your tax money should be able to follow the student. Okay. Um, what do you think of I'm that? I'm happy to answer. I, I, I agree that, you know, I'm, I'm all for getting rid of the property taxes, but we have to fund it some way. And there aren't enough rich people to, everyone has to pay. Like you said, you know, you feel like it's, it's important as an older person to pay. Well, I'm an older person too. Yeah. So we all have to pay. But, you know, if, once you get competition into the public, private, across the parochial, everything, homeschool, you know, you can, if that, those taxpayer dollars can follow the student, you'd see education shoot through the roof. Well, let me, let me, or, let me Pro, answer some of your questions. Proficiency in 2018 here in, New, in Summersworth was 48% for English language. The price per student has gone up almost 5,000 in the, those years, and the quality of the ELA proficiency right now was 38%. So it's gone down, the quality, the 5,000, it's gone up five grand, almost $5,000 since 18 to 2022. But the quality of the education has gone down, and I, you know, I, I like the public schools. <laughs> I went I, to public school, mm -hmm. but the quality needs to pick up, and that's a challenge. Okay, so. let me. You, there were ten questions in there, and I'll try to answer as many as I can. Because it's a complicated situation. It is. Um, let me just talk about um, education freedom accounts. Um, that's something that the legislature passed. Um, and it's very interesting that there's very little accountability for how that money is spent, what the educational outcomes are. There's just about no accountability um, for that. So we'll see. We'll see. Um, now, let me answer. You, you've had your time. Let me answer. Um, in terms of, it's my understanding, and there's a debate about the efficacy of charter schools and vouchers, but the jury is really still out 
about whether that provides a better education. The other thing, and I, you have every right to send your child to a parochial school if you want. Um, one of the differences between parochial schools and public schools is public schools have to take everybody. They have to take everybody. That parochial school doesn't have to take everybody. And they don't have the same obligations in terms of special needs kids or language or all those kinds of things. Whereas public schools, they're the big tent. That's, they have to take all kids. And um, so it's a very different obligation. And I don't know how that parochial school is financed, but I know that there are many private schools where the nominal tuition is low in some ways, but there's funding coming in from somewhere to make up the difference. Um, parents. Uh, parents in some cases, but um, anyway, I think the jury is really still out on those things. It, it really is. And in terms of declining enrollments and costs, costs have gone up. For, we all know costs everywhere have gone up. It, and when enrollment goes down, just think about in a class of 20 kids, if enrollment goes down by 10%, which is more than has happened in one year most times, that class goes down from 20 kids to 18 kids. The, expense, the costs of educating that class of 18 are not very different from educating the class of 20. They still have to heat the building. They still have to pay the teachers. They may have one or two fewer um, computers, but most of the costs are fixed and s small declines in enrollments don't change them very much. Um, so. so I want to give other people an opportunity Fred's talked before. You guys in the back row have talked before. Um, if, there's, if there are other people who want to raise, raise questions. I think questions are great, and people are more than welcome to stay. But I'm going to ask that we let the city staff go home so that we can keep city hall costs down, please. There you go. Um, so again, those who are watching at home, I'm sorry. Uh, you won't catch maybe some of these final questions. Uh, thank you for watching if you're watching at home right now. Uh, but those who are here, feel free to stay. I know, John, you said you were willing at yeah. least to answer a few more. So um, do you want to, are you going to shut off the? Yeah, I think okay. he's going to let Bill okay. go and uh, okay. go home and enjoy his evening. Yeah, yeah, good. <laughs> but, no, that makes sense. Uh, thank you for those okay. who are watching at home.